Through the month of February, the Yarmouth County Museum and Archives is showcasing the reminiscence exhibit, a retrospective on Yarmouth's African Nova Scotian community. To enhance that exhibit and highlight Yarmouth's African heritage community members, uh, today we're sitting down with the Lawrence family to talk about a person that holds particular interest in the reminiscence exhibit, uh, Sheridan Lawrence Sr. So today we're joined by Sheridan Troy and Sheridan Jr. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Candace Fibbs. I'm a new member of the Yarmouth Historical Society Board, um, the Chair of Publicity and Promotions. And also we have Lisette Gaudet, uh, archivist for the Yarmouth County Museum. So we're both going to have a few questions for you. And I'm going to start with, despite the fact that you're a bit of a local legend, Sheridan, it's hard to find information on you, certainly hard to find it online. So to start, can you tell us a bit about your early days, what led you to pursue the sport of boxing, to, the sport of boxing and Troy and Sheridan certainly fill in uh, any blanks about growing up with your dad and his sporting career so well known? Well, it was through uh, my brother, Leroy, I moved to Halifax in the late, in the 70s. And uh, I just took interest on Creighton Street there. They had a boxing club there on Creighton Street. And uh, I just decided to go and and have a look around on Creighton Street and see some of the guys boxing. And I heard about Keith Paris and Buddy Day and them, and uh, they asked me, did I want to try out in boxing? And I was sort of a little interested in it. i done not just the little preliminaries at home there with my brother there when, when fooling around and this and that. So uh, I ended up... Uh, starting a train in Creighton Street Gym. Keith Paris was my manager and Buddy Day was my assistant manager. They trained me and uh, and they thought that I was pretty good and uh, I should be boxing a bit. And they were sort of interested in me, hey? Eh? So I took on boxing there, trained for about uh, six, four or five months and then I had my first fight and I won that. And then I had the second fight and I won that. I had uh, roughly seven, eight, nine knockouts and I never lost a fight. I had one decision and the rest of my fights, one was a draw and the rest of the fights was by knockouts. So it's 12, 12 fights, you 12 fights in total? 12, right? yeah, 12 total fights, yeah, nine knockouts, That's one draw. 1962, 1963, Dad. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, that was 1962 to 1963. I fought for three years, eh? And, uh, and later on, I, Keith Paris uh, was my manager, as I say, and Buddy Day was my assistant manager, and uh, they wanted me to, uh, they, they put an announcement out. Uh, I fought all the guys that, that, that uh, I eliminated and I couldn't seem to find any more fight. Could get any more fights? And David Downey at that time, he will, he held the welterweight title and I wanted to fight him. But uh, you had to have certain people, some people don't want you to get a fighter that's going to be beaten by somebody, hey? So they picked certain fights for him, hey? So Keith Paris uh, wanted me, uh, we put a write-up in the paper for the fight David Downey. And uh, apparently uh, I didn't get any, we didn't get any answer back to fight him. So it made, it kind of made me kind of mad. And uh, later on, uh, Bob Talbot was, a, uh, he was a promoter and he wanted to take me to the States, but I didn't want to go to the States. So... I couldn't get any more fights later on. So David Downey held a middleweight title at that time. And I tried to get a fight with him. And apparently I just couldn't, they, they, they just didn't want me to fight David Downey. Cause I used to train with him off and on. And he helped me to train in a couple of my main fights that I fought. 
he helped me to train and uh i was one fight there that i wanted him to help me to train because it was going to be quite a hard fight with bob wheel on that from bridgewater and uh he didn't show up anyway keith paris helped me out in the ring at that time and buddy day helped me to train i fought with david just practice in the gym there and i don't know whether he was he sort of got afraid of me a lot so but anyway he didn't want to fight me and uh murray uh, murray langford from weymouth was his assistant and they didn't want they used to call me iron jaw and uh, i don't think he wanted me to fight david downey because he didn't want david downey to get beat so <laughs> That was that's, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. <laughs> so they picked certain fights for him. Uh, he was a good fighter. We we're friends and all that. But I wanted to I wanted to fight him bad. I just couldn't get a fight with him. And later on, uh, he put a write up in the paper that I've, I'll challenge anybody for the fight for the middleweight title. And I want, as I say, I couldn't get a fight with David, and he had the middleweight title at that time. Sounds so, like Ed, your your local your local fighters uh, didn't want to fight, and you didn't want to go to the U.S. to fight, no. and so your your boxing career kind of somewhat came to an end because number one, uh, mom was pregnant with me in '63, so that was one thing, and so. You know, to piggyback on that, I don't think she wanted him to box really after that anyway, or especially go to the United States box. Are there any stories or memories that you can share in terms of professional fights that stand out to you or uh, any competitor names that stand out uh, in that uh, regard? Bob Whelan, uh, Bob Whelan from Bridgewater, he was, the, he was the toughest fight that I ever fought. I fought him twice, and uh, he was a, he was he was a pretty good fighter, and that, that was the toughest fight that I had. But uh, I I knocked him out in the second round in the second fight, and I beat him in the first fight. They call it a draw, and uh, it wasn't a draw. I didn't feel good that fight. I was had the flu that fight, and uh, and I wasn't going to fight and, uh, anyway. It was at the form in Halifax, and, uh, and he, they call it a draw. So we fought one more time, and I knocked him out the ring and uh, knocked him out in the second or third round, I think, in the second fight. So that ended that. And that was the last fellow I fought. I fought a couple of guys, uh, one guy from Pearl, and I knocked him out. That was early in the fights. And uh, a couple of other guys from the army there, I uh, mean, from Halifax. And uh, that sort of uh, ended my fight with Bob. Bob Whelan was the last guy I fought. So, professional. Uh, professional. Yeah, I, professional. I remember when I was uh, small. I went pro early. I, I only fought a few fights, and then I went pro right away. Usually, you're supposed to fight about a year before you go pro. But, I automatically went pro in about six months, four to five months, I went pro. So they figured I was good enough to go pro right away, Keith Paris and Buddy Day. So that's that's uh, part of my thing. And later on, uh, after I retired, uh, I couldn't get no fight. So when I moved to Yarmouth in the 70s, as I say, I'm way ahead of myself because that's when we had the boot club after we moved the, the army thing. And we started uh, boxing in the boot club in the army. And my brother Leroy, the green of class, he, he helped me out. He was assistant and I was the coach. And he helped me out a lot because he used to box with a bit. He was pretty good. He fought a lot of fights in the, in the service. I don't think he lost that many fights. He may have lost a couple. He had a couple of good fights. But I, I remember, I remember that he had a couple of exhibition fights down here. I, I remember when I was small um, that some, he had some people come to the boxing club. One of them was a, a policeman from here. Um, 
Lamar. Yeah, Lamar. Lamar, yeah. What was his name? Oh, yeah. Troy was on my box. Yeah, I was on the boxing, and yeah. I remember, like, like yeah. all us. Andre Lemaire. Andre Lemaire. Andre so it was Lemaire, us yeah. little guys. We were all about 12, 13, and they invited some, some, some adults who wanted to come in and spar. So Andre Lemaire, he was at RCMP, locally from the area, and he was about 6, 7. And he got in the boxing ring with my dad. Well, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was interesting because my dad bobs and weaves, and Andre was trying to hit him like this, and he did him come up, smack. It was it was really a lesson in how to box. So I really remember that as being a um, a really great memory. And you mentioned your your nickname was Iron Jaw. I have an idea as to why, but can you kind of elaborate on how you got that? Uh, that yeah, nickname? Well, I was never knocked down or anything, and Rory Langford was the guy that he's my my wife's cousin, I think, and and he was the one that named me Iron Jaw. So it was right, it was wrote up in the paper, in the paper there. That's what they called me, Iron Jaw. So. So the media gave you the nickname. Yes. Oh, very cool. That's when you know you've made it big when the media gives you gives you yeah. flashy nicknames. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So you were you mentioned you peaked or you got into the profession early. Um, how old were you in around 1962, 1963 when you're when you were in the midst of your I boxing was, career? I was around 21, 22 when I started boxing. Something like that when I moved to Halifax. And, uh, is that is that an uh, an average age of when boxers start, or yeah, you know yeah. when they kind of start? Uh, do they start younger or older? Well, usually you start much younger than that. Okay. Boxing, maybe some of them start when they're in the teenagers, even younger, even you know. And uh, I started late. You know, it was late. I just started picking up puzzles. Well, why I went boxing too, because I was looking for a little extra change, change, <laughs> because I was I had a family and I had two jobs in Halifax and, uh, and I was trying to make a little extra money on the side. And uh, so that's, that's what I was doing, why I really went into boxing. But I like boxing. I, I really took an interest in it. And the Halifax Commerce, I used to run around there early in the morning, about 4.30, around the Commerce about two or three times for my training, hey, before daybreak. <laughs> I'm before getting I... um, flashes of the Rocky movies of, you know, yeah. the boxers <laughs> running around the Commons and up the stairs. Yes, yeah. and uh... Uh, and then I went to work on my regular job after I come home and had a shower or whatever and just went to work on my regular job. And I worked there and then used to go training in the evening at the Gary Street Hall after I got off work two or three times a week. I was doing that plus my job. And I was roofing and I went and I was working. Even I had three jobs, I had really. I worked in the chocolate factory at night sometime and then roofing and then uh, driving Eastern paper. I worked for them for seven years, driving Eastern paper truck. I used to deliver all over Halifax and Dartmouth. So. But Dad, uh, just, just not to interrupt too much, but I was called out the old book I have here called Sweat and Soul by Charles R. Sonder. And uh, your name's in here as a middleweight uh, Sheridan Lawrence was a native of Yarmouth. As a teenager, he moved to Halifax, where he became interested in boxing. After training in, at the Creighton Street Gym, Lawrence turned pro in 63 under the management of Keith Ferris. His career was short but spectacular, with a majority of his wins coming by knockout. Bobby Grace, Roddy McDonald, and Austin Williams were three of his better-known opponents. Sheridan tried but failed to secure a shot at Richardson's Canadian title. Yeah, Richardson. Yeah. Yeah. He retired in 66. Larry Richardson. And uh, yeah, settled in Yarmouth. So that's kind of a little tidbit out of uh, uh, Sweat and Soul. 
the Sega, the Sega, the, the Sega Black Box is from the Halifax Forum. Well, who did? You told me that. Yeah, Blair Richardson had the title at that time. In your in, weight class, In bro. my weight class. Dave was a welterweight, but he, he would have fought if he could have, I guess. But he didn't want to fight me anyway. But Blair Richardson had the title, and I tried to get a crack at a fight with Blair Richardson, but uh, I just... No avail. No avail, hey? Yes. They didn't want Blair Richardson to get, get beat, you know, uh, by somebody local, really. <laughs> really, yeah. <laughs> so so you, you, you went yeah. into boxing and told me for, for money and also for to keep in shape. You always like keeping in yeah, shape. Yeah, and uh, Blair Richardson, I was ranked number two for Blair Richardson's title, but I just couldn't, they, they just wouldn't, uh, you, you had to have certain people, uh, they'd not just want to let, Somebody come in and fight Blair Richardson. They picked fights for him. Eh? Mm -hmm. He was good, but he he couldn't take a punch for one thing. <laughs> That's what I was looking at. But uh, any comments yet about Bobby Grace or Roddy McDonald fight? Or well, Roddy Austin McDonald, Williams? he was good. He was very good. Bob Grace was Roddy McDonald. Bob Bob Whelan was the toughest I ever fought. So it sounds like. In order to advance, you know, the your career in boxing, you would have had to go to the U.S. You had kind of tapped out the, at least Nova Scotian market. You were getting refusals for fights, um, and in order to continue to compete and and move up the ladder, it was looking like international was your next step. That's right. Uh, I would have had to go to the states because I we put as I said we put it right up in the paper and uh, and try to claim any any uh, results from anybody that would want to fight. And I, I claimed for Blair Richardson's title, but there was no answer back. So and then I couldn't get any results of any more fights at all, you know. Yeah. Did you ever box outside of Halifax or it was all done in no, Halifax uh, City Center? I lived in Halifax, but some of them was out in Sydney and uh, Bridgewater and uh, Cape Breton. That's mm -hmm. where I fought most of my fights and, and in Halifax. To bring it kind of around to Black History Month and uh, can you tell us what it was like to be an African Nova Scotian competing in Halifax and in other city centers? What was your experience like? Well, uh, Halifax was quite, uh, when I went to Halifax, it was, it was some of the guys there didn't like be fighting in Halifax because they think I was kind of good and they, they didn't want to anticipate some of them. But I, 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 I done really well in Halifax, uh, as I say. I lived in, in a, a, a place there where they were really nice to me, the Browns. And uh, they, they really took a liking into me and uh, I didn't live too far from the gym. Maybe it's a 10 minutes walk. So, so in Halifax, I guess. That was in Halifax. Yeah, so, yeah. so you experienced some, some uh, conflict there. But I guess I think what you might be getting at is like when you went to Bridgewater, you went to Cape Breton fighting. Did you experience anything that was unusual or did, was everything seemed to be okay? You were treated. No, in Cape yeah. Breton, no. Well, I know I was only there for a Yeah, for your fight. fight, I know. So I never come to you. Know, or did you, did, you, did you experience any um, any prejudice or no, racial not, not tensions really, not in the really. city? I used to go to throw off and on mm -hmm. and on. I never really, I knew of it. A couple of my friends was in Corolla, Alva, Paris, and Emma. I wasn't in there that long, really. I was in and out, like, hey. Yeah. Okay. Go to the dances down there once in a while, and uh, but I never found a whole lot of prejudices down there at that time because I wasn't there that long. I right. was just in and out, so. Long enough to knock somebody out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a general musing, if you had have continued on with boxing at a professional level, where where do you think you would have gotten to? What level of competition do you think you would have gotten to? I think I could have been rated pretty high. 
I made an honor made the champion that I thought I was good enough to, to make a champion out of it. Because I would have never went into it if I didn't figure I was good enough. But I figure, and Keith Paris and them thought that I, I would make, make something of myself. I was good enough to do that. And uh, as far as fighting goes, and I had the ability I could hit, and I had the I had the body and everything, and uh, they figured I could go a long ways. Now, in, in 2011, you were inducted into the Yarmouth Town and Country and County Sports Heritage Association Hall of Fame. Um, how did you How did you feel about that? Well, that was that was very good, very good. It took me a while to get in there. It's, it's in the, it's, I'm in Halifax too, I think, in the Hall of Fame. Open Cherry Brook. Chuck helped me quite a bit and, and helped me to get into the Hall of Fame here because he was on the committee. And he he was out home there a couple of times and seen my write-ups and all that stuff. And he fulfilled me in and, and he said, my God, you should be in the Hall of Fame. Because he was part of the Hall of Fame, I guess, Chuck. And uh, he's well known in the Army. And he wrote... He, he wrote uh, in, uh, had me put in the Hall of Fame and seen the committee and everything. And, uh, and I ended up, thanks, to, thanks to Chuck for helping me out to get into the Hall of Fame. I appreciate that. Uh, Troy or Sheridan Jr., are there any additional uh, things you'd like, you know, that you want to fill in the gaps, things, stories your dad shared with you about his uh, his time, his boxing career? It's hard to talk about because I probably only would have been one or two when he was boxing. And uh, it would have been about, you know, a couple of years later. And um, so I, I can't say I really experienced any of his, uh, his fights, which I, I think I wish I would have had, a, had been able to do that. So I I actually was in the boxing club with my dad. So yeah, he was pretty good. He was pretty good. I learned him a few little things, and he was very quick. He had a good jab. He was he was pretty good. He was one of the guys that took the Halifax, and I had about six guys that took up there. Two or three guys from Greenville, and I think two two or three from Yarmouth. Hank Purdy, and uh, I had a I had a pretty good little back. Yeah, we trained. We trained, uh, you know, two or three times a week, uh, running and sparring, and we were ready. And we went. This is the first time we went as a team yeah. up to Halifax, and then the uh, people we were supposed to fight against didn't show up. So again, you know, it's almost kind of uh, legendary with Dad. Anywhere he takes people, you know, they don't want to fight him. They didn't want to fight us. So, but the what what. Uh, I took from it was the discipline, you know, learning how to stay in shape, stick stick with something. It was good, fun. It was it was it was really really uh, great to have people from the road as well, um, being taught by people who look like us. It was fun. It was just it was just a fun experience. Really, so, so, a lot of a lot of great memories. Like yeah, Sheriff said, yeah. it'd be nice if we could have seen an actual. Besides the sparring, I seen the the sparring, which was pretty interesting. But, but yeah, to be able to see uh, something recorded would have been great. So even though the you know official career was short and sweet, and you know ended undefeated, sounds like throughout you know your your life and you know your children's lives, boxing has had an influence and stayed in your life. We like the sport. We still watch it on TV on a regular basis. Anytime there's a big fight on, oh, we're looking yes. to watch it. I love my sports. And uh, Cassius Clay, I was watching him the other night, his old fights that he had. And uh, he was he was one of the greatest. And Sugar Ray Robertson was one of my favorite fighters. He was, he was top notch. Very quick, very fast. And, he was he was my idol, as far as I'm concerned, and Cassis Clay. <laughs> yeah, my dad still even shows my little guy, Nash, how to throw a punch. You know, they yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's yeah. really good. And Cherry's son there, I showed him a few things there. He used to 
punch you on the bag down the basement. I used a bag and a speed bag, Garrett there. He used to chum a little there. But he stayed for a little while, boxed a little, fooled around, but not really interested in boxing. I didn't want him to go in boxing anyway. So. And you don't have a club, like a formalized club you set up. It's a little difficult, right? Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing the details, the memories, everything like that. If we can, you know, pivot a little bit to include Troy and Sheridan Jr.'s experience in, in uh, the local area. Uh, Sheridan, you're a small business owner in Yarmouth area. Can you tell us a bit about your small business, any challenges, successes that you've experienced as a African Nova Scotian business owner? Uh, I can say I've had a very positive experience as an uh, African Nova Scotian business owner in Yarmouth. It's uh, been very good and uh, I've been uh, had lots of support. Um, I was uh, proud to have uh, some African Nova Scotian students in um, my shop, um, probably uh, probably before COVID, so a couple of uh, years ago in February, uh, when students came in and we had uh, um, designed a T-shirt, and uh, it was a Bruce Johnson picture on it with uh, which the class had selected who they wanted to uh, celebrate and, and do on a tea, and then they participated in. Um, in, in the making of that tea and doing a bit of the screen printing and stuff like that. So that was a very positive experience uh, within the business and um, positive aspect uh, within uh, our African Ocean community in Yarmouth. I actually read an article about uh, just that, just uh, about a week ago. I found it in the in the Vanguard, so it's funny you we bring that one up. <laughs> All right, on. No, thank you, thank you. No, it was a it's a good memory. Yeah, that was uh, initiated by uh, Marjorie Dion, my my cousin, who uh, is a student support worker uh, with the DCRCE, which I was too at at one time for a couple of years, and uh, it's a very positive. Uh, program within the DCRCE, the uh, Student Support Worker Program, for sure. Excellent. And Troy, you and your wife own and operate a small business in Yarmouth as well. You've worked with African Nova Scotia Affairs. Can you tell me about a little bit about your experiences in those regards? No, well, it's, it's really been a, a full three, 360 for myself. When I, I think about when I graduated from high school here, I received a um, a bursary from the African uh, Baptist Association for um, academics in Nova Scotia. And when I was up on stage, I remember looking out in the crowd, not really recognizing anybody, probably a thousand people there. And they gave me money so that I could afford to make myself better. And ever since that day, I always wanted to be able to give back. So, and really didn't know how, right? How am I going to do it? Am I going to move back? Because I was in Toronto for 12 years. And if I do move back, how am I going to, you know, integrate myself in the community? So I was lucky enough that when I moved back, uh, fast forwarding, I ended up applying to African Nova Scotia Affairs and, of course, getting the job. And it became a perfect platform for me to be able to give back. But that's one thing, giving back to the community on, on the broader level with respect to grants and contributions. But also, you know, when you live away and you come back, and even if you live here, sometimes it can be months before you see anybody that that you went to school with or whatnot. So um, we are fortunate enough to be able to start the restaurant, you know, and, and build build from the ice cream parlor to ice cream juice bar and now full service restaurant. It allows people to come and see me, you know, I say come and get the food, but also get a chance to see me. And uh, I get to rebuild and, and, and talk about those wonderful memories. And we were fortunate enough, like I say, in 2020 to receive um, the BBI um, Entrepreneur of the Year Award, which uh, really allowed me to know that we were appreciated by more than just uh, the people even here in Yarmouth, but outside being recognized for the efforts that we're doing uh, within the community and in the province. Excellent, thank you so much. and. Uh, Sheridan, I've worked with you several times on, you know, different projects for the community, different, uh, and you've been so supportive and always appreciate, I, I always appreciate the chance to support your business. And since uh, 
Troy, you and your wife opened uh, Honey Bees from the ice cream parlor, you know, just watching that grow has been amazing for the community. Uh, thank you three for your time. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you, to hear the memories shared. And uh, I, I hope we have the chance to sit down and talk again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Candice, for the kind words and your support uh, uh, with respect to less printed. It's very nice to see my two sons has got a business in Yarmouth because that that is great. I'm so proud of them. Yes. Thank and you. on behalf of the Yarmouth County Museum and Archives, thank you so much to all three of you uh, for everything that you do in the community and for speaking with us today.